My name is Philip Nelson. I am the co-chair of the Sports Streaming Summit for Streaming Media West, and I'm also the president of Nelco Media, former 20-year uh, exec at the company called New Tech that made the TriCaster. And uh, we're really excited to have you guys here to talk about IP video today and what it means to sports production. We do have a pretty cool panel today. I'm going to briefly introduce each panelist and their company, and then I'm going to let them go down the list, tell you guys a little bit about what they do, and give you some context as to why they're here, and then we'll jump right into the discussion. Um, going down from my, my left, we have Mark East from 090, Me 090 Media, That's correct. Victor Borchuk from Jupiter Return, John Rydell from the NFL Network, and Jack Levy from, from Flow Sports. So Mark, start off, if you would, and just tell us a little bit about 090 Media. So 090 is about three years old. Uh, we provide a pretty wide array of live streaming services to a, a diverse group of customers, everything from multi-camera production to facilities design and integration to backhaul coordination, delivery, player integration, the whole, the whole value chain, glass to glass. Victor? Cool. So, um, Jupiter Returns, my company, we've been uh, in the live streaming, live production space for about uh, 10 years and started out uh, putting together a live workflow for uh, Tom Green, for his Tom Green live show. So it was about the same time that uh, Justin put together the Justin TV backpack. So it was kind of a simultaneous development. Over the years, we've uh, done everything in live production, moved on to kind of original content creation, have created a couple original properties that have been both TV and web uh, hybrids over the years. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, IP workflow is something that uh, is a great thing, and I, I feel personally it's kind of like the first moment since, as Philip said with the TriCaster, like since the 800 series, like the eight input TriCaster, that everybody's super excited about. It's kind of the first moment since then that I feel uh, kind of rekindled that excitement in the in the live streaming world. So, John, uh, I work at NFL Media in Culver City, our studios. We house everything from. Uh, uh, shows on NFL Network, everything from uh, NFL.com, um, including our digital side, uh, podcasts, things like that there. Jack? Hi, right, we're at Flow Sports based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, we have over, over 20 uh, verticals of sports that we cover, everything from super uh, small end type stuff to very large uh, scale type sports. Um, and my role there is anything tech related, uh, supporting the producers. All right, you know, the thing I love about this panel is this entire panel is a bunch of studs in this industry and they undersell themselves because I know them all and uh, I know the projects they worked on are like, oh, I do some podcasts at the NFL, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so since this is an IP panel, um, let's just throw it out for discussion. What is IP video and why should anybody in this room care? And we're not going in any particular order, so if, you'd, if you have some comments, you can just say what you think. You don't even have to comment if you don't want. So, okay, like I, like I was saying, I mean, um, IP video, it's funny, uh, my mother, when she, uh, early on, she, she, like somebody asked her what I do for a living, she's like, oh, he works with cables. So it's a bit ironic that I'm on a cable. He works with cables, nice. <laughs> so a little bit underselling, but it's ironic that I'm on a panel about cables. Um, but yeah, I mean, IP video, it's great because it's like, you know, you know when we started, it was this challenge of, getting a video to appear on screen and, and all that type of stuff and it was like that that was the accomplishment and now it's kind of changed that whole workflow so i mean a lot of the stuff um you know like with we do a lot of esports so both in the united states and, and in brazil we do a lot of esports events and with that you have all these pov cameras and you have all these feeds and depending on the level of the event as you all know you're probably all live producers here that's why you're here in this in this room but it's you know there's always the, can we just, or oh, is that a problem, or why can't we just do this, or can we just add that? And you, you know, you've spec'd out a show, and then usually you have a little bit of contingency built in there, but you know, with things like NDI and IP video, it's so easy to be able to say, yeah, well, you know, we can make that happen, or we can, have, we can make this happen. And you know, we did uh, recently an event in Sao Paulo called uh, Brazil Game Cup. So it's the largest, Brazil Game Show is the largest esports, um, like, or not esports, but like gaming convention in Latin America. So it's like 350,000 people, something like that. So on par with Gamescom, much bigger than E3. And it, within that, they have uh, a tournament. So we've done that since it, since it started in 2014. And you know, it's, it's evolved over the years, and now we have 10 POV cameras, and we you have- you to play like, your video while you talk? Would this be a good time? Uh, we can play it afterwards, because it's got like okay. a cool little music track that makes, okay. you know. 
just to get the full dramatic effect. But um, you know, there's a lot of things where it's like you know, the last day, oh, we have four spectate PCs for this thing, like, by the way, which you know, a lot of people would be like, oh my gosh, four spectate PCs. We only have X amount of inputs on the switcher. We can't do this. So it's like with that workflow, you know, we can install the NDI scan converter, and it's like a non-issue. You know, everything on that is like set in five seconds. It's the last thing on anybody's mind. It works perfectly. And then we're worried about something else. Um, same thing with like mobile. On that event, we had 48 mobile phones in a tournament. Super easy to get feeds from all that. We had all the spectate PCs. The budget on those events isn't super huge, so it's it's always like you know. I mean, it's. It's much easier to do an event when you have a huge budget, a huge sponsor that's coming in paying for everything because you can just, you know, we all know you can order whatever you need from B&H or from VER and it's not a problem. But if you don't have a big budget, then that becomes the challenge. Like, how do we still get this event off the ground? How do we still make it happen and look good without having, you know, a million dollars to do it and without not making any money? So, you know, able to get that POV integration off the ground, make it easy for everybody, put one switch to the stage, wire everything in there, one cable comes back to the switcher, nice and easy. The first year we did the event, they had five screens, so five iMag screens, five discrete mixes, plus, and then in addition to that, we had the live mix, and then that was all done out of one switcher. So we were able to use every possible output on the 860 and make it happen <laughs> with like three people, so. So, um, how many? I get. An, I wanted to get an idea of the audience. How many of you guys or, or girls in here are in, in production on the production side? Raise your hand if you're in sports production. How many of you guys are affiliated with like the rights for the sports? Okay, no rights people here. Um, all right. How about uh, uh, what do you guys do then? I mean, uh, what uh, you know, tough you crowd the, here are tonight. You at the right convention? Yeah. Like you, like you own the, you're, you're with a team and you're trying to figure out what to do with your team rather than saying I'm a production company who's hired by the team. You, you buy rights? Okay. For, for what type of sports? Okay. Cool. Those are all good. Congratulations. Anybody else want to chime in? Because we can kind of tailor our discussion to fit the audience. Uh, Anyone else, or if you're shy, that's okay. So, you know, a lot of people um, that are getting into IP video for production, they kind of compare it to replacing the SDI cable with Ethernet cable. Um, would you guys agree with that or disagree? Or what is, what is I know Victor has kind of given his overview of what IP is for Jupiter Return, but any other guys want to comment on what is IP video? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I was concerned coming into this panel that, like, you know, NFL Networks was maybe going to talk about 2110-based technology and stuff like that. I, I think for my business and the customers that we work with, it's all about NDI at this point for a number of reasons. Um, but I, I think, and I think NDI is more uh, of a game changer than 2110 is because 2110 is basically just SDI over IP, right? Right. Um, with a few bells and whistles and a few advantages, but with NDI you can do things like, um, I mean, the, the, the whole MDNS portion of it and being able to uh, uh, recognize uh, sources on your network instantly and that sort of thing enables set up to be a lot easier, enables uh, you to have a lot less crew, a lot less engineers worrying about connecting point A to point B. So um, I, I think that's, that's the advantage there. Um, uh, would you agree? I would agree. How many of you guys know what NDI is? Raise your hand if you know what NDI is. For the rest of you, um, I'll give you a quick summary. Um, you know, NDI is an IP standard that was created by NewTek. Um, it stands for Network Device Interface. and it is an it is a it's I, it's not really an open standard because it's owned by New Tech, but they license it for free to anybody that wants to add it. So as of right now, I think there are over 400 companies that have added NDI technology, including Panasonic, Ross, um, VizRT for graphics, AJT, which was just acquired by Dactronics, is a graphics platform also technologies like Wirecast and OBS and you know basically it is becoming the de facto standard for video over Ethernet because it is so open and, and flexible um, and so that's basically what NDI is and so uh, 
you know, if you have questions, also, we're not going to just save questions for the end. So as we're having our discussion today, if you have a question, raise your hand. I do want to bring the mic to you so that the recording gets your question. Um, does anybody else have a comment on the uh, NDI um, or what on IP and your workflow? Um, what it is like Jack uh, at, at Flow Sports. Um, we're just going to bounce around a little bit. Actually, we'll just kind of go to another topic and we can circle back. You know, has the transition for either of you guys um, to IP allowed you to do something that you couldn't have done before? And I know Victor kind of alluded to this, but um, what is IP? What what doors has IP video opened for you guys? I, I would say at Flow Sports, what's interesting is we we're in a lucky position where we get to do everything from really low end. I say low end, but basically like we have to be really cheap because we're servicing a small audience to very high-end stuff. In the high-end stuff, you can't be as risky. And in my opinion, NDI is still a kind of risky thing, depending on how you're using it. But one of the things that makes on the low-end NDI so interesting is uh, when, when uh, New Tech brought out the NDI HX sparks. Those sparks convert an NDI signal to something that's only eight megabits on the low end. And with eight megabits, putting that inside of an IP network, and when I talk about an IP network, I'm talking about you got Ethernet connected, you've got maybe a wireless network connected, maybe you're running fiber for your internet. It's so flexible, you can do anything, right? But the biggest problem you have is most of the devices you have are gonna only be able to, cap only capable of up to 100 megabits. So <coughs> under 100 megabits, well, I'm sorry, if you're using a regular gig network, you're talking about 1,000 megabits. So 1,000 megabits with full NDI core signals, typically a full NDI core signal out of, like NDI, out of Viz or OBS or anything is going to be a full 100 megs. That means you can only fit 10 signals on a network going into your computer or whatever your main source is, right? But with the NDI HX, being able to compress everything down to 8 megabits, I can fit a ton of those on my network, right? And at 8 megabits, I can put that over a Wi-Fi network. I could put it over maybe a point-to-point -point network, right? To where uh, now something that might have only been able to do 100, 150 megs uh, with, the wire, with the wireless system, I can now send a ton of video signals over that. Granted, maybe there's gonna be some inherent latency, maybe there's gonna be some uh, jitter, but if you're in a place where you can be a little more risky, and in a lot of places where we're at, we can be a little risky with what we do, it gives me the ability to do things way cheaper um, and have way more of an advantage uh, versus if I had to run SDI cable and fiber. For instance, if I do softball, I've got to run fiber for all my softball cameras, but maybe it's a low-end softball tournament, and so instead of doing that, I'm gonna do Ethernet, because Ethernet, I don't mind if it breaks, right? But my fiber cable is $3,000 a pop. I don't wanna break those, right? So being, being able to have that kind of flexibility to go over fiber or Ethernet, or even maybe a wireless network is huge for what we do. But then also to be able to mix in different protocols into the Ethernet network. So for instance, if I'm at a, let's say a, 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 we do marching band, and with marching band, I've got to get audio from the field up to the press box along with cameras. In the current way you do things, you've got to run fiber down there for maybe your cameras, but then you've got to run big XLR snakes at the top. With, uh, with Ethernet, I can put my audio on Dante, I can put my cameras on NDI, I can run one fiber signal down there, and I can convert everything over an, an over a IP network. And so we can put all of, our, all of our information on one cable. That's good. Um, anybody else want to add anything to that? Yeah. Uh, as, yeah, as, you, as uh, Jack was saying, that, that's kind of, to me, I would agree in in sense that NDI is not necessarily like the end all be all. I mean, oh, yeah. it's not like, it's about using it in the right way. And that's, it, it follows very well into the whole kind of mentality and ecosystem of, of TriCaster and everything else that New Tech does, where it's like you have this box that does X task, but can also do Y and Z if you needed to, like, you know, and so when the client comes to you and says they want to do this or that, you have all these kind of capabilities available to you to kind of make anything happen. And so, like he was saying with NDI, if you're in a stadium, you know, if you have an encoder that's five feet from your TriCaster or whatever your switcher is, I mean, does it make sense to do it over NDI, which is an encoded video versus uncompressed SDI? I mean, if you really want to, but you know, if, if there's some reason to do it. But I mean, it's one of those things where it's not really like, it's not saving the day or making any difference one way or the other. But if you're in a stadium and it's, you know, a thousand or 500 feet down to the field, do you want to run fiber all the way down to the field? That's going to cost money to run this. You got to run it all the way down there, all these types of things. It can get crushed here or there. 
or does the building have a 10 gig or you know, whatever network and you can run everything up from, this, up, up from the field to your switcher over their internal network, nice and easy, focus on the show and do a good show versus spending the entire time accomplishing the technical task and the show is horrible because you've been spending all day wiring up a camera. So, I mean, it's like having that ability is great and it's just knowing where to use it and where it doesn't really make sense. I, I would agree, I would say, I mean, if we're saying that NDI is the current de facto standard for IP video, at least for in-house routing, maybe not for contribution, but for in-house right. routing, um, there is some inherent risk in using it. Uh, you know, first of all, it's, it is compressed video, it's not uncompressed. So if you need to work with baseband video, it's not your ticket. Um, it's not you know, uh, as stable or consistent with timing um, so a, as 2110 or t even 2022 were. So that would be you know, another thing. The, the biggest thing for me though is that uh, new tech, I, for, let me preface this by saying I love new tech. I've been a new tech fan for f probably 15 years now. I, I evangelize the hell out of their stuff. Um, they, are, they really enjoy explaining the effectiveness of their technology with Magic, it's new tech magic, right? So um, if, if by their documentation, they're saying that a 4K NDI source would take up roughly 250 megabits on your network, but then they tell you that a TC1 can take in 16 concurrent 4K sources, and then you do the math and you figure, well, a TC1 has two one gigabit NICs, so they're basically saying you can jam twice as, many, twice as much data into your unit as you possibly could, and then you ask them, well, how is that possible? And they say, magic. That's not, you know, well, it's great, and it is. The, here's the way, I, I, you know, having worked there, I do know the magic, right. and I will give you guys a secret. Boy, you're gonna reveal some magic. Well, yeah, I will reveal some magic. The, you know, and, and before I say that, you know, for those of you that are new to IP video, as he mentioned, there are other standards. So SMPTE has the 2110 20, 20, and 2022. And those are SMPTE standards, and, and those are 10 gig standards. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge when you get into IP video is managing your bandwidth on your network. And so if you're using a standard that is 10 gig and you have five cameras, you gotta have a pretty beefy pipe. And, 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 and there is a time and a place for that. And like these guys have said. It has 10 gig. It does. Right. And which is intercompatible with that. And, and that, I think that's one of the reasons that the NDI has become a de facto standard is because not everybody has 10 gig networks already, but most people have gig E everywhere, um, unless you're at the AT&T Center and then you have 10, you have a, a hundred, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, when they did their stadium remodel, they actually did not upgrade the network, so. Sorry, I live in San Antonio and I give them a hard time about that. But, uh, you know, so that's something to think about is your bandwidth and, and, and also, you know, when you look at the 2010, 2110 and the 2022, those are not bi-directional. You know, those are like SDI, you plug in your camera, the output of the camera and feed it to the input of a switcher is the concept. And where NDI has done really well is it's bi-directional, so, so it can send and receive. So if you want return video at the camera or you want to have audio coming to and from. So that, that's one of the reasons a lot of our, our guests are, are using that is just it's very flexible and it can work on a lot of networks. Um, but um, so where was I going with that? <laughs> we have derailed completely. I got some stuff to add. Yeah, John. Okay. So I agree with a lot of stuff that these guys are saying, and I'm not here about to disagree with anything that was just said. Um, I'm in a, a s different situation um, in our studios. I'm in a uh, facility that's 12 years old, and it's kind of a, a facility that's grown with our company. Uh, we started off as a one control room, one stage, and now we house six stages and six control rooms. Uh, we're not on, in the field, and it's not a pick up and go kind of thing. And a lot of our technology, for the most part, before my time at NFL Network, uh, starting four years ago, was very all baseband video. My switchers house a uh, Sony 8000s. It's, it's a traditional cast iron switchers. Um, and those workflows. Coming in and uh, with the digital expansion of NFL Network, we inserted a TriCaster 8000 into our podcast room. We also did it into another digital studio. Um, but uh, coming up in a few years, we're moving to Inglewood into the new Rams stadium and we're going to be looking for expansion. And yes, we're looking at uh, standards, IP standards like SMPTE 2110 and 2022, um, or 2020, 2220. Um, 
but we use currently today, we, we are using NDI as well, and I can give a, a great example. I was speaking to Jack before this, um, a quick example of a way to insert NDI into your workflows now that create a lot of more flexibility. And uh, I see this a lot with uh, social media. Um, there's so many social media tools out there that are all web-based, um, whether it be Spreadfast, Tagboard, um, Vidpresso, uh, anything that needs a scan converter. Um, the traditional broadcast way of working with that workflow is taking your computer and taking an HDMI out, uh, throwing it through an SDI converter, and then that, that source probably needs a scaler. Um, and then it would go into your router system or your, your switcher. Um, so I've seen that this problem. We have currently, we're using social media in that capacity um, before my time there. And then uh, as our social media and people want more social media tools, we've grown, we've had to add, oh, well, we need a, a new spread fast computer. We need another uh, social media tool. Um, so we've started to expand and that's where NDIs come in. Uh, we built a server. Um, much like, uh, I believe it's uh, the NCIO model. It's a one rack server um, using NDI Connect Pro. And what this uh, software does is takes a NDI source on your network using, in this case, a scan converter. So uh, in the example, we'd be using Spreadfast, which is a web-based software. And the uh, social media producer has that software running on a computer and it's now, uh, on the network as an NDI source. Uh, we're porting it over into our engineering network through a firewall. Um, and NDI Connect Pro <laughs> takes that source uh, that's on the network, uh, captures it, and we're then spitting it out SDI. Um, no scaler involved, none of, these, none of these three different connectors, and, and we've just done it cleanly from a straight IP into uh, spit it out a, uh, SDI into our router that doesn't need a scaler. Um, and it comes with embedded audio, so then, you know, within the, your current studio workflow, you're still de-embedding your audio and things like that. Um, and it can reach now any uh, control room, because that was the one of the bigger things that, you know, IP signals are great, and switchers that could take in IP signals are awesome, right? Um, and that's a great win for a, a TriCaster or, or whatever another switcher could take in an IP source. Um, that want to use that social media tool, but what about all the other switchers that are SDI only or haven't, or I'm working with older technology. So like I said, I'm working with a 12 to 15 year old switcher um, that's SDI only. So that, that converting tool has expanded our, our reach and new technology and it's something that we're taking um, great look at as we're planning for our next facility. Cool, anybody have any questions so far? Um, we can have a, a, a roundtable discussion with audience participation. Um, so, Jack, how many sporting events does Flow Sports do a year? Is that a secret number? I mean, because I know uh, I've been to your facility, and when I walked in, I was blown away by how big it was and how many people you had. But is there anything you can um, talk about, uh, about the number of events you guys need to do and how IP is allowing you to to kind of drop the, the, the cost of production? Um, I know you're not a public company, so not everything's public. Yeah, I, I, I actually don't know the number uh, off the top of my head. The thing that I would say as far as relation of IP, it's a big number, basically, is, is what he's getting at. More than 100. <laughs> yeah, well, more than 100. Um, I think we're, we're, we're getting close to 1,000 a year, if not more, I don't know. But, but, keep, uh, but a lot of that's feeds that we're not producing in-house too. I would say the number that we produce with producers in-house, because we have, I think we have 27 live producers now, is I think getting close to 500 um, a year. But the way, the way the IP is so big for us is like, example, so he's talking about hardware switchers. I don't know how many of you guys deal with hardware switchers versus TriCasters, but if you're in a hardware switcher world, like it's getting, other sources other than cameras into that versus like the one or two HDMI inputs you have is impossible. So it's like, okay, cool, I got these HDMI things I need to get into my broadcast and my producers are doing this on a regular basis now, like whether it be graphics or um, YouTube videos that they want to play, like we're, we're just, we just started bowling and one of the coolest things I've seen the bowling guys do, these guys are producing, we're doing 27 lanes of bowling, right? And all 27 lanes are live. That's been our model for a long time. We don't just do the big show, we also, you know, every bowling lane is live with the camera. It looks stupid probably, but like you can watch anybody at the same time. But so while all those 27 lanes are live, 
we're pulling all those 27 signals back into one switcher, whether it's vMix, whether it's a TriCaster, whether it's a, a hardware-based switcher, right? But you've got to use something to bring that stuff back in. So I've got all these cameras out there, and they're all NDI-enabled. Whether the cameras are NDI-enabled or the computers are NDI-enabled, or we're just using Sparks, the NDI Sparks. We love the Sparks. We bought a ton of the Sparks. The, the, uh, you know what I'm talking about? The, HTA, the HX Sparks that NewTek came out with? Look it up. If you haven't seen those, look those up. Those are the magic, that's the magic box right now, in my opinion, because they're so cheap. But so taking the HDMI signal out to a Spark, so it's an HDMI to Ethernet converter, Ethernet all the way back to this one hub, you know, all these Ethernet connections, and then into one computer. And in that one computer, I'm seeing all 27 signals. And then I've got a commentator who's able to switch between those 27 signals. He, and he knows the sport. He knows what he's talking about, right? And he's watching these guys, and he's talking about bowling as he's switching between all 27 sports. But what if, what if he can't do... Well, I shouldn't get into that. But, but my, my point is, IP broadcast has enabled us to do a, a, a scenario like that where he's... I'm getting off topic now. Not really. No, you're good. <laughs> where, he's, where he's commentating on 27... Thanks. It's similar to like what you would do in you know in gaming. You know, in gaming, you've got so many. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these gaming conferences, but there's so many guys at these things that are. Yeah. It's all over the place, and you got to bring all that back to one thing where someone can talk about all that together. NDI enables us to do that. But then one of the cool things they'll do is like, let's say Joe so and so is up there and he's getting ready to bowl, and like, oh man, I've got a great clip of him on our YouTube page. Let me pull up YouTube on this computer. I'm gonna make it full screen. I'm gonna NDI, NDI it into my TriCaster, and boom, there's this replay I have now that I'm rolling in re real time off of just YouTube, which is awesome. Or if I wanna show something that's currently live on the site from a different event we're doing, maybe there's another bowling tournament happening over in a different state, and like, oh man, let's do a little highlight on that. So he'll pull it up on his laptop, he'll make it full screen, pull that into the TriCaster, and he'll talk about it for a second without the audio. Like, that's the kind of stuff that we're able to do with NDI that's made our shows just a thousand times better. Yeah, as Jack mentioned, one of the things that is cool about IP video is if you have a switcher, it's getting all the cameras in, but if, you're, if you have multiple switchers on the same network, all of those switchers can see all of the sources on the network, not just the cameras coming in, but also the program video going out of the switcher. So if you have team one over here, that's switching a show, Team 2 could take their program feed as a live source or select one of their cameras or even any of the graphics inputs they have. So it really is mind-blowing the scalability that IP brings to the live sports production table or any production table. Like having like a video router built into every switcher. And I mean, I think the thing that you're seeing in general, the theme here is, you know, I mean, as you know with any sort of... <laughs> <laughs> it's time to take your like, medicine. With any, I mean, with any sort of technology, there's always like, you know, the, I mean, the first, you know, the first touch screen device or whatever. I mean, there's always that first company that comes out with it. Nobody cares. And it like passes silently and it's forgotten. And then 20 years later, the people that are really into it are like, oh, wow, but the real inventor was this guy that did it, but nobody bought it. And it's the same idea with, with IP video. I mean, there's, there's all these different standards, and there's the SMPTE standards and all that, but there's the one technology that really pushes it over the edge and kind of causes the, the sea change as, as far as the industry goes. And I feel like that's where NDI comes in. You know, because you, you see NDI, everybody supports it. Every, every switcher allows inputs, even people that aren't, like, it, it, things that are not related to new tech that new tech doesn't sell have been forced to have NDI integration because it's just, it's the new thing. And, and, and like you said, I mean, there's, there's a thing with, if somebody wants uncompressed video and if somebody wants something that's, you know, that's baseband, that's fine. And that, that's like still available, that's not a problem. And like if the camera is 10 feet from the switcher, I would say that using IP video, like if you're doing IP video because the cable's lighter, like I guess, I mean, you can, but like it, it, it seems kind of stupid to me, but whatever. But there's a bigger play there where it's like, you know, yes, the cable's lighter, but also, you know, you plug it in, it just works. You can do, like you said, two-way, it's bi-directional. So there's so many things that you can do with it that the other standard doesn't do. And that's kind of where it excels. I think what might be interesting, like I, I find it interesting that we're talking almost exclusively about NDI at this point. It, does anyone on this panel or anyone in the room feel that 2110 is a viable alternative to NDI now? Will it be in the next year or two? Does anyone have experience with SMPTE 2110? Anything like that? No? Okay. Cool. I know you guys do because you use everything at the NFL. Well, we're testing SMPTE 2110 uh, for our next facility. We're not currently using it. Um, one thing I will say when comparing the two, and a lot of uh, comparison is 
it, there's some validity to it um, where SMPTE 2110 does feel like SDI over another cable. Um, being from a younger generation, I kind of say, think, I look down at my watch, it's the year 2018. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, so, can, can you use more than one SMPTE 21 per, uh, signal over one cable, or is it one to one? Well, it depends on the, fiber. Yeah. Oh, over fiber. Okay. Yeah. So if you have one so, fiber network, how many how many SMPTE signals can you put over SMPTE 2021? It's 10 so, gigs per gig, yeah. per stream. And how many 10 gigs per stream? So if you have a fiber line, fiber line has. It just depends on your network yeah. size. But what what I was getting at is, I'm looking for a bigger jump in my lifetime. I mean, we're, we're in a transition here where we have people that have lived through tape, analog video, the conversion digital, the conversion from, uh, from SDI now to IP. Everything is still from that back with analog video, everything is still linear. SDI is linear. Um, IP video for the first time is now introducing non-linear elements, and this is my, my biggest, per, one of the biggest things that really drives me nuts. Um, it's 2018, and we're about to, not we as the NFL company, but as, a, as an industry, we're about to introduce uh, a technology that's essentially uh, SDI over an Ethernet cable, but the IP signal doesn't even uh, support embedded alpha. And in embedded alpha, someone say, hey, well, what do I to care about embedded alpha? I'm doing a video, video source. Uh, it's just full range video. But all things considered, like I have um, Viz IP machines. And for those who don't understand, a graphic source it needs a key and a fill signal. So that is two, so in a, in a in a linear workflow, that's two video signals going into my switcher. That's two sources taking up just to, for me, just for the TD to marry together and create the, the overlay graphic source. In an IP workflow, how are we progressing towards that source just coming in with embedded alpha and taking up one source into your switcher and, and laying over? And on top of that, uh, how aren't we working towards a way to uh, record that source with an embedded alpha for those, for those who want to um, have a uh, VizRT machine and record all those graphics um, with motion and record them as video clips um, to put into post as embedded alphas. You know, I just look at the year that we're in and I'm, I'm thinking, how aren't we 10 years in the future already? I mean, you uh, look at like audio and Dante and how that's changed. Yeah. I mean, it's like you have, that's kind of full feature. Yeah. Like full feature, everything that you need that was on baseband analog yeah. cables is now digital. Yep. So that's where we need to get with video. Yeah. You know, that's a great segue because, you know, the, the panel is about IP video, or actually it's about IP, how IP is revolutionizing sports production. So let's talk a little bit about audio because um, you don't have a show without audio. You know, people are more likely to turn off a show that has bad audio then if it's great, if the audio's great and the video's bad, they're more likely to watch. If it's got bad audio but the video's beautiful, it just grates on your nerves and you turn it off. So where is audio going in the IP space, which you've already touched on, but, and how is it different than video in the IP world? Well, so Dante is expensive. And we're currently struggling with where we're going to go with audio because for me, there's three things that have to happen over IP video. It's not just your audio, it's also your comms. Because how are you communicating? Now, obviously, I don't know how many people have used like Unity comms or even like Discord or TeamSpeak. You can do it over cellular, no problem, too. But the problem is like that's on your phone. I want a hardware device. And there are some people who out there who are making Dante comms. But at the end of the day, Dante is expensive. So I've been looking, I've been researching uh, all the lower end people. Maybe you guys can touch on the higher end stuff. But on the low end, like you have Behringer who have makes their own protocol, and it's the Super Mac protocol. You have Personas that makes their own protocol, the AVB protocol. I, don't know, it's pretty, I think it's a couple people use AVB. But the problem with those protocols is like they're using Cat5 cable to do things, but it's not IP. You can't put other things over that cable. I'm interested in like I want to run one cable, whether it's fiber cable, Ethernet cable, or some sort of Wi-Fi network, and I want to put multiple things over that. Um, and that's where right now one of the few that I've seen is Allen and Heath. Allen and Heath makes a, pro a protocol over their DSnake proprietary. 
technology, that it's a one-to-one -one thing right now, and it's not Dante, but that is one on the lower end, if you guys are interested, they make a protocol that basically it is still IP, so I can run one cable to run my Allen Heath stage box near my talent back to where my mixer's at, and then I'm also mixing in my video signals. On the high end, obviously, you run Dante. What do you guys, what else are you guys using besides that? That's about it, I would say, I mean, yeah, Dante is, is daunting. Like yeah, daunting for I mean, sure. Daunting. I would say it's it's getting more it's white. It's getting more like mainstream though. I mean, you're yeah. seeing a lot more low end mix. Not I went low end because it sounds kind of insulting, but yeah. like you know less expensive mixers. I mean, you're, I I feel like you're seeing Dante become something that's out of the range of super high end audio people to kind of becoming more consumer grade that a lot of people can can start to integrate in their productions. TriCaster supports the virtual sound card, mm -hmm. so if you're using NDI and you have a Dante enabled mixer, then all of a sudden now it's like you have all of that audio floating around the network because it's bi directional. You can sub mix everything, you can assign whatever mixes to whatever channels, get things to where they need to be. If your host needs something on their program mix that isn't going here, that's not a problem. So I, I just feel like, I mean, to me, NDI is kind of this, and IP video in that way is kind of, it's, it's a nice merger there because they're both full featured enough to become you know, a one cable thing that then you just, you program on your end. And wait, if you have like a free speak system, then you have your comms over that too. Mm -hmm. Everything's kind of all IP based and you're kind of fully moved over to that sort of workflow. So far, any questions? Anything you would like us to elaborate on? Yes, sir. Let me, let me come down there and let you speak into the mic so that your question is recorded for all time. Well, uh, talking about remote production, or remote multi-camera production, do you think that IP is, is something that obviously needed for that, those kind of, of production? And I would like to know what, what experience you have to share with us regarding those Remote scenarios. in what way? Like remote, like single camera live view type no, of I mean, thing? No, multi-camera remote oh, production. Yeah. Yeah. Like an at-home model? Yeah. Excuse me? Like an at-home or Remy model where you've got cameras out in the field and everyone else is back in yeah. the studio? Yeah, yeah, Remy model. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it all, it all depends on IP. Like, that's why there's a lot of people doing, you know, Remy stuff over satellite fiber still, but everyone is moving to, to IP, uh, certainly. Um, I mean, there is no solution for NDI, for, uh, not, although I guess CMS, yeah. NDI. Yeah, so, yeah, we've been playing with it a lot. That's a huge thing for us right now. Um, NDI Sienna's, NDI Sienna, and then um, there's some guys over in Russia. What's those guys? If I remember it, I'll tell you, because they've got a really compelling one right now. But like, honestly, that is, I think, the biggest thing. I think it's super cool what LiveView does, and I think TVU has a great thing. And they all make awesome stuff. It's a one-to-one -one scenario where you've got a camera that goes into a backpack of some kind or a little box, and then on the other side, you have a decoder that decodes it all, and you go back into a switcher. But like, I think what the future is, with NDI anyway, is like you have all your signals coming into a Ethernet, uh, you know, I'm sorry, a switch. That switch goes into a computer, and that computer is running some sort of program like NDI Sienna tools. Um, or the other, the Russian guys, or the, even Media Looks makes a thing. It's on much more on the high end, but basically all those signals now are on your network. And whether you VPN it back to home, or whether you've got a fiber pop from like here all the way back to home, but basically you're able to get a lot more signals compressed in their world. That's the only thing is like they are compressed, so these signals are getting compressed down to three megabit signals. But it's the same thing with live. Usually lossless but compressed. So it, it, it yeah. all depends on it all depends on the client if that's a thing to them. And and to speak to your question, I mean. If you're doing a remote production and it's a room of this size and you have three cameras and you have talent sitting there, I mean, do you want to run it over Ethernet or do you want to run it over SDI? I mean, that's, you know, it's up to you, like, if, that's a, if, if it makes you feel better to have an SDI cable or an Ethernet cable, I don't think that that's really where the beauty of the technology comes into play. But if it's something like a remote production where, like, for the, uh, the eSports thing that we did, where, you know, yeah, I mean, we, we drive to this venue from Rio you know, so you drive five hours, put all the stuff in a truck, you know, drive over there. So it's, it's a remote production. It's not in a studio or anything like that. We set all this stuff up. So that, in that way, I mean, totally makes sense there. To, you know, to get there two days before the show and wire up, you know, 10 cameras into a huge router and get all these things done, I mean, that'd be a nightmare. And like, not only would it be a nightmare, but to have something with that sort of capacity, then you're out of the range of like a TriCaster workflow. So you have a different whole switcher. Like the budget would like, balloon up, the show would never happen. We wouldn't be where we are today. So in that respect, like, totally makes sense there. Because now you've done stuff, you know, a guy that uh, they produced uh, Game XP and Comic Con Experience that came into the control room and it's two people and he's like, I can't believe what you guys are doing here. You're feeding five screens, you got all these cameras, you got two guys here, it's crazy. 
But I mean, it's, and, and it wasn't like nobody was stressed out. It's like, you know, I mean, it was uh, focused and doing the show, but it, like, we know everything works. Everything's nice and stable. Are there hiccups here and there? Like, you know, what something, a new firmware upgrade comes out, new software upgrade comes out. Occasionally you have something here, but I would say like 99.9% .9 of the time, perfectly stable, works, no problems. Like, I've never had a problem deploying it on a show, running the latest software, never worried about it. Never like lost any hair or like shaved any ears off my life or anything like that, so. <laughs> and, and the good news is, is we do have a panel coming up this afternoon at 2.45 that's Guerrilla Tactics, Cellular Bonding and Remote Production. And Lowell's in the back, back there. Um, he is, uh, he's gonna talk, he does at home production for the PGA Tour. And, or is it the PGA Tour? PGA of America, I gotta get my uh, organizations right, but we're gonna deep dive into at-home production and that, and it's gonna be pretty interesting using bonded cellular and other technologies. Victor, I wanna get your propaganda video in here, and I want you to talk, well, you have music, you want them to hear it. So Not let's take yet. a look, This uh, set this video up for us so of what we're is, seeing. It's just some shots of the event that, I'm been, that, that I've been talking about this entire hour. Um, so it was put together by a team in Rio, and it just you know shows like the five screens and, and all that type of stuff and all the different um, kind of things that NDI has enabled. All right. So we may not have audio, so your big audio reveal may not be there. So you can just but so you know you have all the IP sources there. This was an event in Tampa. Uh, it was a fundraiser for St. Jude. This was the one in Rio. And it, again, it was one of those things where this is like a. They're both events that were kind of like grassroots events, so not like a, a huge budget, but we made it all happen, and it's ultimately two people that are making this entire thing happen, switching all the screens, making all of that technical stuff happen. So it's like overall a team of eight with producers and everything involved. So, so that's that. Very cool. I hope that it was life-changing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh... Um, you know, how many, any, any of you guys in the eSports world? Anybody doing eSports? You know, it's crazy from my perspective of being in new tech for 20 years and then now being an independent, basically video equipment dealer, um, is the, the amount of money being thrown into eSports. It is almost scary to, you know, Caesars and you know, all these casinos are building esports arenas. They're building a brand new esports arena in uh, Arlington, Texas. They built one here in LA. It's millions and millions and millions of dollars going into this. And they're not doing it just because they like it. There's actually money to be made. So, uh, Victor, uh, uh, Jack, at Flow Sports, have y'all done any esports stuff or is it strictly traditional sports right now? We, we tried. Uh, we did uh, uh, Street Fighter. Uh, but some, the community, the, the thing about esports is the community does not want to pay for it for the most part, um, at least for, from our experience. Those guys are so used to Twitch, which is free, and they're so used to things that are free, it's really difficult to make them pay a subscription. And Flow Sports is a subscription model, so it didn't work out for us. But Victor, you've done a lot of yeah, esports. Yeah, I, mean, I think, yeah, in, in, in my perspective, yeah, I mean, I, maybe for a subscription model, I would, I would agree that probably wouldn't work there. But um, yeah, I mean, we've done a, a lot of eSports events with a lot of different, um, a lot of different organizations, like from Riot, from when they started streaming to, to you know, currently when it's a big deal and like Philip said, there's a ton of money behind it. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of, there's a lot of eyes on those shows. So, and, and there's a lot of eyes on them. So there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of sponsors involved. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of events like the, like that one that you saw a clip of there from Tampa where it's a, a grassroots event. You know, it's like a small organization that puts this together. But at the same time, like, you know, an esports audience, like if you make a mistake there, like you're going to hear about it. You're going to get memed like to death in the comments. You know what I mean? So it's memed like, to death. you know nice. what I mean? It's like, no matter how pristine the audio is, there's going to be somebody that complains that the audio is bad or that there's lag. So, I mean, that's where, like, you need things that just work all the time because there's five million other things that happen, and, and those events change. They're so fluid, like, like any sporting event, but maybe even more so because these people are used to, you know, traditional sports, you're kind of used to, you watch a football game, you watch a basketball game, you watch a baseball game, it's pretty linear, you're, you kind of know what's going to happen, it's a pretty fixed model, but a, a lot of times, you know, th those events, it's like, when you're used to that kind of digital world and you grew up in that world, it's kind of like, well, can we just do this? Let's just throw this in there. Oh, so-and-so is going to do this. And you have to kind of be able to, to move on the fly and adapt to all that. And having the flexibility of, of all these things kind of 
makes those things more fun and a creative thing that you can add to the show versus something that's like, like a stress point that everybody's got to have a panic attack about. So. Yeah, I think we, we do a lot of esports. We've worked with um, Blizzard, Riot, ESL, uh, Twitch directly. And I think one of the advantages to uh, an IP-based workflow, specifically a, a, a bi-directional IP-based workflow like NDI, is that it's easier to integrate um, things that aren't necessarily broadcast standards. I think one of the keys to esports viewership is having interactive elements in your, in your coverage, being able to have overlays, because you know, everyone's used to Twitch, and there are a billion different like, HTML5-based uh, uh, stats overlay platforms out there that you can use as a caster on Twitch to you know, show how people are doing in a game and that sort of thing, and being able to integrate those directly into the workflow by using something like NDI Scan Converter or something like that uh, with an embedded alpha channel and just key it and it looks pristine and it looks you know, really pro and it's virtually free. Um, you know, that type of thing is, is, is really valuable. Um, uh, you know, otherwise, you're talking about uh, uh, using a, a bunch of relatively expensive machinery to do the same <laughs> thing. So I think it, it, it's huge for eSports. So uh, if we don't have any questions so far, we're going to kind of go into the last phase, the final Jeopardy round here of our IP panel. Um, we're talking about what we can do today. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, like with John, where it should be. But, you know, where are we going with IP? Um, where do you guys see this taking you? What new workflows do you think that will open up from this new IP-based production technology and or what do you want to see you know does anybody have anything I know John is very opinionated on this topic so um, I expect him to have something very good here no pressure John well I think my biggest one is the embedded alpha for both live and post um, that one's a huge one for me it just doesn't make any sense to me uh, I would love to see uh, IP workflow um, I think multicasting is great Get, gets rid of a lot of uh, DAing and, and splitting uh, issues that SDI has. Um, I would love to see better integration with de-embedding audio and getting uh, audio mixers involved with, uh, he, uh, Victor said about uh, Dante-enabled audio mixers. I'm not an audio guy, I work on the video side. Um, I'm going to be researching those after this um, because in my in my podcast studio uh, we have a problem with video so or audio sources getting in. Uh, we just keep on adding and adding sources, and, and the 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 switcher can expand because of IP video, but my audio mixer can't, and I have a um, issue there. So I'm gonna be figuring out some some examples there to fix that. Uh, but to me, it's definitely introducing more non-linear workflows that a lot of um, this industry has, you know, has really been ignorant to or hasn't, ha people are doing in post-production that can be now used in, yeah. in our live workflow. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, just like he was saying, I, I think the technology is finally getting to a point where it's enabling these IP standards. You know, I mean, encoding and decoding is getting to the point where um, the latency is usable. Things like that. I mean, you know, you know how it used to be. It's like you, you know, encoding a video and that type of thing is like a challenge, you know. But these days, you know, you're getting almost real time. And I think, like, you know, one of the big things with IP video, um, you know, like um, we we're talking about uncompressed and compressed. I mean, I, I mean, I would say visually, you know, visually lossless. If you took somebody off the street and had them compare that, it's like, you know. I would, I would imagine most people wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah. You more, know what I mean? More to the point with NDI, yeah, generationally lost. Right. Like you can just go yes. five, six steps down the line and, you know, and, and it still and looks And that's great. only going to get better. You know? I mean, this is kind of like, it's finally pushed that over the edge. It's finally become a mainstream thing, and it's only going to get better. And I think quality and coding is going to improve even more, and at the same time, latency. So you, know, you get better chipsets, more advanced chipsets, and coding is going to get better, latency is going to drop, which is... You know, when you're doing a show, like uh, probably a lot of people do shows, you have iMag and you have a program switch. That's a, always a thing is the latency to the iMag. But, you know, integrating IP video, you have a little bit more latency because you are encoding that and then running it through whatever switching device you have. So as that gets better and you can drop that down to that same, you know, one or two frames, which will happen, 
that's going to, I mean, it's just going to be a refinement of like, you know, your first iPhone versus the iPhone that you have today. You know, I mean, it was great and it's only gotten better. I'll chime in on Victor's comment. You know, one of the benefits of IP versus a traditional SDI or analog style workflow is latency is introduced with every box that's added to the workflow. So if you come out of your computer into a scan converter, that would add latency. You come out of the scan converter into a DA, and then out of the DA into your switcher, and then out of the switcher into a scaler, and into your projector or screens, every one of those boxes will add in, even if it's milliseconds, it all, you know, it's whatever box is added in last gets the blame for all the delay, is usually the way the customer looks at it. But where IP really opens doors is you don't bounce through those boxes because it is a multicast type technology. You're, you're taking your IP video and feeding that eventually into a projector. Right. You know, my, my soapbox is eventually every camera is just gonna have an ethernet port on it. Every TV is just going to have an ethernet port on it. All of your devices are just going to be IP devices and then you can take this content and do with it as you wish. Instead of, because right now there are some last mile things that need to be solved. Oh. You know, like, like John was saying on some IP standards, they don't have alpha channel or the audio because one of the challenges I've seen as an integrator is Dante wants to be a priority on the network for your audio. NDI wants to be the priority on your network for video or even SMPTE 20 whatever. <laughs> Any of the buffet of SMPTE 20 somethings. Um, but so from an IT perspective, it's like how do you configure your network is it a VLAN or whatever, so that it, Dante, your audio has a priority on the network and, and your video has a priority on the network and they meet there at your production tools to have synchronized audio and video without fighting along the way. Right. You know, so, but we're, you know, from my perspective, eventually every camera will have an ethernet port and that is how you're going to get video out of the camera. We're already seeing that in like Panasonic cameras and JVC cameras and a lot of the PTZs that are out there where they all have SDI and they all have HDMI, but they also have an ethernet port so that you just don't use your baseband video anymore unless you need to. Well, and then that first hop to the network is then out of camera. So that initial latency that you see now is reduced even more because it's coming straight out of the camera. So once you get that first hop onto the network, and like you said, everything's the same. Now we just need an actual broadcast camera that natively supports NDI or, you know. Yeah. Because that, like, coming. that Panasonic 4K PTZ that they're about to release, that thing looks awesome. But yeah, it is a. Right. And it's a, <laughs> right. Well, we hope. It, but it's a PTZ camera. The glass isn't great. The, you know, it is what it is. But the, you know, if we had an actual broadcast camera with broadcast lens mounts and, and that sort of thing that, that supported NDI. Right now, I just built a, a studio up in LA that um, it, it's, it's all 4K. It's just a little studio, three cameras, but it's all 4K. And so I've got, you know, Blackmagic broadcast cameras and they're outputting their semi-proprietary 12G SDI out to Teranex converters, which output quad link into an NC1, which then outputs NDI to the network, which is great. But I've got three boxes sitting there that could go tits up at any moment. And, you know, th those are unnecessary as far as I'm concerned. So that's I mean? where we're going. One, one cable to rule them all. Absolutely. Um, and it's going to be Ethernet. Here, here. Um, anybody have any questions for our panelists uh, about IP video? Anything you'd like to know? And I would like, this would be a really funny joke to play on Panasonic. They do have a booth here. <laughs> so sometime today, I would like everybody in this room to just go up to Panasonic and say, when are you guys going to have a broadcast camera with, with Ethernet on it? So it would be, because I know those guys, and they're going to come up to me and go, man, we got all these requests, you know? <laughs> so I think that'd be really funny. So help us with this virtual heckling process to go, you know, if you see a camera manufacturer, ask them about their Ethernet jacks on their cameras for the future on broadcast cameras. I know I do that every time I see them. But uh, anybody else have anything they'd like to add to this IP discussion? One last hurrah as we wrap up the panel, because we have like two minutes left. Anyone? Uh, any, any wise words? I just want to thank everybody for coming out today. Appreciate you guys sitting here and, and listening to us banter about cables. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot about of bantering. Cables. All right, and from up. the audience, any last minute questions? Y'all have been a very quiet, respectful audience, so if you'd like to heckle or anything at this point, now is your last chance. 
Ask us a hard question that we can't answer and, and end on a crazy note. Anyone? But anyway, yes, I, we have a question. Yeah, I have to come down and you have to use the mic because you must be immortalized on the recording. So. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, you're dissing on the SMPT standard and, you know, NDI has got some technical benefits, but is there any um, license or stability concerns? Um, I guess new text freely licensing, licensing it, but I'm just kind of curious if that's a consideration or sort of a non-issue because you're so interested in the tech. Any of you guys want to comment on that? In terms of cost for licensing well, or? Is concern that, that you, it's not as much of a standard or it's a different body pushing it? Yeah, I mean, Andrew Cross, the uh, New Tech CEO, has always been pretty uh, adamant about stating that they weren't trying to circumvent any sort of SMPTE, you know, standards ratification process. They just wanted to make this open standard available for everybody. Um, and, I, and I think he has. I, I think, you know, to, to Philip's point, once every camera and every switcher and every everything has a, you know, gigabit or 10 gig uh, Ethernet port in the back, those two standard, you know, 2110 or whatever becomes the next 20 whatever uh, plus NDI can coexist on the same network. I, I don't see a reason why they wouldn't be interoperable or you maybe have a software toggle in your device to, to jump between the two. But right now, I, I would say for many, many reasons, NDI is, is, is a, a more um, feasible standard for, for everyone than, than 2110 just in terms of its limitations. Unfortunately, that body moves relatively slowly and they got when they released 2022 and then f everyone started shooting 4K, 2022 went by the wayside. So now they're doing 2110 and everyone wants bi-directional, they want tally and comms and a whole bunch of other stuff over one cable and so I think 2110 is also going to go by the wayside. But that's just my opinion and we'll see what happens. You have a question? <laughs> well, I'm just going to make a statement that 2110 is Hold on, hold on, hold on. You got to be recorded. Sorry. We must be documented. That's my job. Uh, so the 2110 suite of standards really is meant to encompass everything NDI does today. Mm -hmm. It does take a long time to get all those guys in the room to agree on a way to do it that will service the industry for 10 or more years. NDI is an example, and like Dante is a proprietary uh, built in the lab, you know, kind of a solution that works, especially people that do stuff with it like mm -hmm. yourselves. You guys use it every day. Of it. I would never knock it, right? But it's a stopgap, really, mm -hmm. because that's where it's simply 21. 10 is going to, for the professional community at the upper end that would use 12 gig SDI, those guys. So. Yeah, no, I would agree. Very good point. That's why we have uh, open mic. Um, well, guys, I really appreciate you guys spending some time with us here at the Sports Streaming Summit. Um, you know, our panelists will be wandering around the show and you can probably corner them and ask them additional questions. Um, our next panel that's coming up in this uh, session is going to be, let me flip to my calendar here, it's going to be at 1.45 p.m. and that panel is leveraging social sites for your sports broadcasts. Um, we've got uh, Make TV on the panel, Stanford University, uh, Skyline Media, and we've also added in um, one other panelist and it's not in the program. So. Hopefully we'll see you guys back, and we do appreciate your time, and we appreciate your sport, support of Streaming Media West. It's, uh, I, I've been saying all weekend that this is the most beautiful location for a conference on the planet, so uh, it's hard to explain to our spouses that we're here working when they see the photo. So my name is Philip Nels with Nelco Media, and I appreciate you guys being here and, and uh, sharing your knowledge and information, and uh, we hope to see you back at our next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>